Welcome back for more Bio 20. Today we're going to talk about plants. And here are the objectives. We're basically looking at a whole bunch of plant diversity. So last time we looked at viruses and the variety that exists within viruses. And then a little bit about the immune system. And how uh, defense versus immunity turn out to differ from each other. And the key piece being recognition. And immunity comes with memory, whereas defense does not. And then we also dealt with how vaccines try and give you memory without giving you the virus. So when we look at plants, it does help if we first define what plants turn out to be. <clears throat> it's kind of hard to talk about them because we think we know what they are, but you can find exceptions to things like, oh, they photosynthesize, and that's not always true. But we do know that plants use cellulose in their cell walls. And they also use a phenomenon of reproduction called the alternation of generations. Again, they're not all photosynthetic. The alternation of generations is when they oscillate between a haploid state that we call the gametophyte and a diploid state that we call the sporophyte. We categorize plants into what we call divisions. And... One of those divisions are, includes what we call the avascular plants, or the bryophytes. These are going to be things that we'll talk about in a bit. And then we have the vascular plants, which you could break into the seedless and the seed-making, or the flowering plants. Or the, the ones that make seeds can either be flowering or no flowering. So when we look at those avascular plants... <clears throat> We collectively call those bryophytes, which are hornworts and liverworts and mosses. They evolved almost half a billion years ago, and there's something on the order of like 200,000 species. They are very understudied, so if you wish to have stuff named after you, <clears throat> study uh, bryophytes. These lack vascular tissues, which means they have to live in wet environments, and they are small. And the reason why they're small is because they have to rely on osmosis and some pressure tricks in order to move water around because they don't have the equivalent of blood vessels, even though it's not blood vessels, I'm using air quotes, but you can't see me doing that in them. The vascular plants, on the other hand, all will utilize vascular tissue. And in plants, these are referred to as xylem and phloem. Xylem, super simplistically, are dead at um, functional maturity, and they move water and stuff dissolved in water, like minerals. Phloem is actually going to be used to move organic molecules, so it has what we call the sap. So when you think of sap from a tree or a plant, it's usually coming from the phloem. And this act, all the cells are alive, and there's a lot of active transport in that. They are very complicated in how they work. That's not our purpose. Amongst the seedless plants, we call these things like club mosses and horsetails and whisk ferns and ferns in general. So like this here would be a fern. They're sometimes famous for having these things called fiddleheads and what have you. And if you look underneath their leaves or the sori, you could see these little uh, spots which are going to be the spores. These came into existence around 300 million years ago, and they were fer uh, ferns the size of trees, so huge, huge ferns. These can get big because they have xylem and phloem, so they actually have vascular tissue. Seeds then came into existence, or evolved, and these are the first of them are going to be what we call the gymnosperms. So gymnosperm means naked seeds. <clears throat> and they form cones. And the cones are going to form what we call microspores and megaspores. So again, these are going to come from cones. Microspores are going to end up forming what we would call sperm. And the megaspores form what we would call an egg. There's a whole bunch of different types. Uh, you've probably seen conifers before. So think of like a Christmas tree or something like that. That's an example of a conifer. But there's others that you probably haven't come across, like cycads, although I pointed one out to you at the start of the school year, but doesn't mean you remember it. Uh, I also tried to point out a ginkgo, and we pointed it out on the field trip that we took. We don't have any netophytes for me to show you on campus, but those also would be an example of a gymnosperm. 
the tallest, largest, and oldest single organisms on Earth all turn out to be gymnosperms. It's not the same plant. So the tallest would be the redwoods. Largest are the sequoias. The oldest singulars are going to be the bristlecone pines. And you can actually tell when you look at a conifer the different types of cones because you actually... So up top will be where you'd have the female cones. Bottom is where you'd have the male cones. The flowering plants are referred to as angiosperms, and they actually have very distinct flowering structures. Flowers can be what we call complete or incomplete, depending on if they have all male parts, female parts, or if they're a combination of male and female parts. <clears throat> they have male and female parts, we call them complete, and if they don't, we call them incomplete. <clears throat> Their reproductive style is really strange, it's called double fertilization. They actually need two sperm and the sperm are going to be identical. And they actually will fertilize two different parts. So when we look at you know, spores or pollen, the pollen itself is actually going to end up forming the sperm. So within it, that's actually where the male gametophyte turns out to be, which is right here. And the two sperm are going to end up pollinating two spots. So one location is referred to as the polar nuclei. And the other spot would be the egg. And between those two, turns out we get our double fertilization. If you have a monaceous plant, that would be a plant that turns out to be male and female parts. So it's one plant hooray and hip-hip, as opposed to a dioecious plant. So dioecious plants are, quote, sex and a, quote, male and a, quote, female plant. So that would also dictate whether they have complete or incomplete flowers. We usually break them up into what we call the monocots and the eudicots. There are other types of angiosperms. They're called basal angiosperms. Most famous of those are magnolias. But usually people don't care. Uh, for our purposes, we only care about monocots and dicots. Uh, these talk about this thing called a cot, which is a cot elidin, which is an embryonic leaf. So if you were to ever see a plant emerging from the ground, you'll usually see something kind of like this, where you have like these two funky leaf things that are aiming down. Those would be the cotyledons. And they immediately fall off. They don't stick around too long. When we look at their structures, monocots turn out to have some characteristic, uh, well, structures to them that make them easy to identify. Think of grass. If you think of grass, you can usually figure out most of the monocot characteristics. And then eudicots are, think of anything that's not looking like grass. So that, that's usually an easy way to figure them out. We did go on a field trip. Uh, I thought it was fun, and we even got to visit the horticulture greenhouse. Next time, we're going to talk about animals. <laughs>